This presentation is part of a lecture series on the C++ programming language by Michael Adams at the University of Victoria in Victoria, Canada. Uh, for those of you who might be interested, a copy of the slides for this lecture series can be downloaded from the website whose URL is given at the bottom of this slide. This presentation constitutes a work in progress. It's definitely far from perfect, but hopefully it's of sufficient quality to serve as a useful resource for learning C++. For the benefit of those of you who may be relatively new to programming, including many of my students, I'd just like to make a few comments regarding the examples that appear on these slides. Often, in order to make an example short enough to fit on a slide, it's necessary to make a lot of compromises in terms of good programming style. So some of the deviations from good programming style that are demonstrated by these slides are such things as uh, frequently formatting the source code in utterly bizarre ways in order to save space, uh, not including any comments in the code, using short meaningless identifier names, and so on. So these things are truly evil. Do not ever do them in real code, but understand that for the purposes of examples and fitting them on, onto slides, it's necessary to do some of these truly evil things. In the material we've covered so far on concurrency, we've been looking at things from a more abstract point of view without focusing specifically on how things are done with the C++ programming language. Now we're going to start shifting the emphasis towards C++ specifics. And to begin with, I want to talk about threads and how threads are managed in C++. In the standard library, there's a class called thread that is used to represent a thread of execution. This class provides a means to create a thread, wait for a thread to complete execution, and perform other operations to manage and query the state of a thread. Now, before proceeding further, I just want to take a moment to point out it's important to make a distinction between a thread object, in other words, an object of type thread, and the thread itself, in other words, the actual thread of execution that's scheduled by the operating system. The reason it's important to make a distinction between th these two things is clearly they're not the same thing. And in order to make this distinction clearer on the slide, in cases where the word thread is referring to the type name thread, this is uh, written using a typewriter font. And in cases where the word thread is referring to the, just the thread of execution, this is written in a normal font. Now, a thread object may or may not be associated with a thread of execution. A thread object that is associated with a thread of execution is said to be joinable. And we have a number of ways that we can create thread objects. We have a default constructor for the class. And the default constructor simply creates a thread object that's unjoinable. In other words, the thread object is not associated with any thread of execution. We can also uh, create a thread object with a constructor by providing a callable entity, either a function or functor, which I'll just refer to as a, a thread function, and any arguments that are required by the thread function. And this results in a new thread being created that invokes the thread function you specify with whatever arguments you've specified. Now, if a thread function takes any arguments, the arguments are copied by the thread constructor, and copies of the arguments are used when the thread function is invoked. And this is important to understand. The emphasis here is on the word copies. Um, if reference semantics are desired, in other words, if you want one or more of the parameters of the thread function to reference arguments provided to the thread constructor, then you need to use a wrapper class like the reference wrapper in the standard library. The thread class, or objects of the thread class, are movable but not copyable. The reason for not allowing them to be copyable is it's not clear entirely what semantics you would want for a copy operation to have. So rather than having some highly non-intuitive behavior associated with it, you're just simply not allowed to copy threads or thread objects. Uh, each thread object has an identifier or ID these IDs are unique for all joinable threads. In other words, threads that have threads of execution associated with them. And the thread IDs are the same for all unjoinable threads, which is essentially a dummy ID, which is not really associated with any thread of execution. Two key operations for thread objects are join and detach operations. So I'll talk about each of these in turn. First of all, a join operation waits for a thread object's thread to complete executing, and it results in the thread object being marked unjoinable. 
A detach operation de de dissociates a thread from the thread object. Essentially, it allows the thread to continue executing independently from the thread object, and the thread object becomes marked unjoinable. As I mentioned on the previous slide, thread objects are movable, and if you perform a move operation on a thread, the thread object that is used as the source for the move operation, it becomes marked unjoinable as a result of the move operation. An important thing to point out about thread objects is that at the time that the destructor of a thread object is called, the thread must not be joinable. In other words, there cannot be a thread of execution associated with a thread at the time the thread is destroyed. And this makes some degree of sense because you, you, you don't want to destroy a thread object if there's actually some thread of execution associated with it because once the thread object is destroyed, you lose the ability to refer to or access that underlying thread. And this could be an indication of a programming error. So for this reason, if you try to destroy a thread object and the object is still joinable, the library will, the standard library will throw an exception, basically indicating that there's probably a programming uh, error that you've made. There's a static member function in the thread class called hardware concurrency. And what this does is it returns the number of hardware threads that could be run simultaneously. Because you, you may want to know in some applications how many threads can the particular platform you're running on, how many threads can it handle at once, how many can it run simultaneously. The only thing that maybe I should comment on about this particular function that might not be obvious is that it's allowed to return the value of zero. In the case that it's not well defined how many hardware threads can run at the same time, the value zero can be returned. So make sure that you handle that case if you're using this function. And thread creation and join operations establish what are called synchronizes with relationships. And I'm not going to comment any more on these types of relationships at this point because this gets into some more advanced concepts. But we'll come back to these at some much later point. This slide and the next summarize the key members of the thread class. So there's two member types, ID, which is a type that's used to represent thread IDs. Native handle type, which is a system dependent handle type, which I'll talk about a little bit more on the next slide. And then we have constructors, destructors, and assignment operators. And the key thing to remember here is that thread objects are movable but not copyable. So you have a move constructor and a move assignment operator, but there is no copy constructor and there is no copy assignment operator. The thread class has a few more member functions. The first of these is joinable. The joinable member function just returns a boolean indicating whether or not a thread object is in the joinable state. The get ID member function returns the ID of a thread object. The native handle member function returns the native handle for a thread object. And what the native handle is, the native handle is just some kind of operating system dependent or platform dependent way to identify the actual thread of execution that's associated with the thread object. And typically the situations where you use this particular member function is if you want to gain access to some additional functionality for threads that's not provided by the programming interface in the thread class directly. You wouldn't normally want to use this unless you really have to because if you start relying on the native handle then your code will become platform dependent and it won't work on all C++ implementations. The next member function is a static member function called hardware, hardware concurrency and this gets the number of concurrent threads that are supported by the hardware. And uh, keep in mind, this can return zero in the case that this quantity is not well defined. The join member function performs a join operation, which essentially waits for a th the underlying thread of execution that's associated with a thread object to finish. And then it marks the thread object as being unjoinable. Then the detach operation, which essentially dissociates the thread of execution from the actual thread object and allows the thread of execution to continue on executing its code independent of the thread object. And it also marks the thread object as unjoinable. And then the swap member function allows you to swap two threads. Or I should say two thread objects. <laughs> 
At this point, it's worthwhile to consider an example of a simple program that utilizes the thread class. So on this slide, we have two versions of the classic Hello World program that have been rewritten to make use of multiple threads. So to begin, let's consider the version of the program on the top half of the slide, so this code up here. So looking at this code, we see that we have this hello function, which simply prints the standard output, the string hello world exclamation mark followed by a new line. And the basic idea of what we want to accomplish in this program is we want to execute the hello function in a new thread. So if we look at the main function below here, of course the main function is the entry point to any C++ program. So obviously any C++ program must have at least one thread because you have to have one thread to actually execute the main function. But the basic idea in this program is rather than call the function hello and have it execute in the thread that's executing the main function, we want to create another thread and run the hello function in this new thread that we've created. So to do this, what we do is we create a new thread object. In this case, it's called T. And for the constructor parameters, we specify hello. In other words, the function that we actually want to execute in this new thread of execution that we're creating. And this is going to have the effect of creating a new thread in the operating system, which will execute the function hello. After this, we then perform a join operation on the thread object T. And essentially what this will do, this will wait for the thread to complete executing. So the join member function will not return until the hello function has completely finished executing in the new thread that we've created. And in addition, the join function will mark the thread object T as unjoinable. And this is important as well because at the point when T is destroyed, which is going to be at the end of the main function here, it's critical that the object T, the thread object T, must be in an unjoinable state because it's considered a programming error to destroy a thread object that's still joinable. If we look at the bottom example on this slide, this is essentially just the same program, but it's been rewritten to make use of a lambda expression. Here we have a lambda expression instead of an explicit function called hello, but otherwise that they're functionally equivalent. On this slide, we have another simple example of a program that makes use of threads. And the purpose of this example is to illustrate how parameter passing works, in particular, passing by value or copy semantics. So here we have a function do work. It takes two parameters, an integer parameter i and an inter integer parameter j. And the function simply prints out the standard output, the value of i and j followed by a new line. Then the main function, it creates an integer variable i and initializes it to 42. It then creates a thread object called t1. And the constructor is passed three parameters. The first is the function that we actually want to be executed in this new thread that we're creating, which is do work. So we're going to be executing this function do work in this new thread. But because the function do work has two parameters, the parameter i and the parameter j, we have to specify the values of these parameters here for the constructor. So i, this value here, which is equal to 42, it's this local variable, i, has, which has the value of 42, is going to be passed into the, as the first parameter to do work. And the value of 1, this integer variable here, is going to be passed in as the second parameter of the function do work. So when we start up this new thread that's associated with the thread object t1, it's going to execute the function do work, and do work is going to be invoked with the value 42, which is what i is equal to here, as the first parameter, and then 1 as the second parameter. And then at some later point, the thread will actually you know, execute, do its thing, and print out the value in i and j here, and then finish, at which point we then, in the main thread, we are very careful to make sure that we join, perform a join operation on the thread object T1 because again, we have to make sure that at the point where a thread object reaches the end of its lifetime and it's destroyed, that it must be in an unjoinable state. So this is the reason why we perform a join operation. This mark will mark the thread as unjoinable and essentially what this achieves is that the thread which is associated with the thread object T1 will no longer be any valid thread of execution.
On this slide, we have another simple example of a program that utilizes threads. And the purpose of this example is to illustrate how we can achieve reference semantics when we're passing parameters to a thread function. So in this example, we have this function do work, which takes a single reference parameter, essentially a vector of ints, which is passed by reference, as this parameter v, and the function doesn't really do anything too interesting. It simply prints all the elements in the vector. If we then look at the main function, we create a, a vector of ints called v, which is initialized to 1, 2, 3, 4. And the next two lines here, we, we're creating a thread object called t1. We're specifying for the constructor the first parameter is the function that we actually want to invoke, which is do work from above. And we're passing a single parameter v, which is our vector that we want to pass into the function. If we look up above here, where this function is using pass by reference, because we have a reference here, so you might think that when this function is executing here in the new thread that we're creating, that this variable v, or this pr reference parameter v, is going to refer to this local variable in our function main. But this is not going to be the case, because if you recall, when the when we're passing parameters to a thread function or passing arguments, a copy is made of all of the parameters that we specify to the constructor. So V will be copied, and then the reference parameter here is going to refer to that copy. But this is probably not what we want in a lot of situations, and it's not what we want in this particular example. What we really want is we want this function do work when it's invoked to have this reference parameter v here actually refer to this local variable here, the one that we're trying to pass into this, this new thread that we're creating. So the way we can get around this problem that there's always this copy made is we can, instead of passing v, instead we pass std ref of v. And what this ref um, function does is it takes v and basically wraps it in a, a class called reference wrapper which is also in the standard library and this reference wrapper class what it does is it takes whatever type you're wrapping and it, it makes it behave as if it's a reference to that object and if we do this then when this function do work is invoked, this reference here will actually refer to this local variable here. In other words, it will refer to v, this thing that's being passed here. Unlike in this case where v will actually, ref in this case here, v will actually refer to a copy of this variable v. The example on this slide is very similar to the one on the previous slide. The only real difference is in the manner that we're passing arguments to our, the constructor for the thread object. So on this line here where we're creating our new thread object T1, we're still specifying a thread function do work like in the previous example. But here we're using the move function in order to pass V by moving rather than pass it by copying. And this might be desirable in some situations, like for example, if v was a very, very large vector, which isn't the case here, but if it was very large, there would probably be a very large advantage to moving rather than copying. Aside from this, this example is very similar to the previous one. On this slide, we have an example program that illustrates moving of threads. So if we look at this code, we have a function called makeThread which creates a thread object that essentially prints to standard output hello world exclamation mark followed by a new line. And here we're using a lambda expression just to make the code a little bit more compact and more easy to fit on the slide. And then this thread object is simply returned by the function make thread. Then the next function that we have called identity, it's a very simple function. All it does is it takes some thread as a, a parameter and then it returns that thread back as a return value. Then if we look at the main function for our code here, what we do is we create a new thread object, T1, and we construct it by using the return value of the make thread function. Because the return value of the make thread function is a temporary object, it's an R value which is safe to move from, 
So this will use essentially the move constructor to construct the thread object T1, and it will be constructed by moving the thread that we made in the make thread function into T1. Then we create another thread object called T2, and we construct it by moving T1 into T2. This, we need this move function here because if we left it out, it would try to do a copy construction by copying T1 into T2. But because you can't copy threads, this wouldn't work. So instead, we have to do some finessing of the type system, basically a typecast, which is what the move function performs, so that T1 can be moved into T2. Then we proceed to do some move assignment operation. So we take T2 and we move it into T1 by an assignment operation. Then we take T1 and we move it into the identity function as a parameter. Then the identity function will return that thread back by moving. So it will be moved back into T1. So essentially all we're doing here is we're moving T1 into the parameter that's being passed to the identity function and then this is just being moved back in T1 again. And then we perform a join operation to join on T1. In other words, wait for the thread to complete. We don't need to wait on or perform a join operation on thread two because thread two was the source for a move operation. And when we moved out of T2, in other words, when we use T2 as a source for a move operation, this mark T2 is unjoinable. It no longer has any thread of execution associated with it. Therefore, we don't need to perform a join operation down at the end of the main function here for the thread object T2. In the standard library, there's a namespace called this thread, and it has a few very useful functions in it. The first of which is called get ID, and this returns the ID of the currently running thread. This is very useful if you have some code that can be called in the context of more than one thread and you want for that code to be able to determine specifically which thread it's actually being called from. So this allows you to find that out. The next function is called yield and this is just a way for the currently executing thread to, to uh, suggest that it might be good for the operating system to schedule another thread to run in its place. For example, maybe the thread doesn't really have anything to do. The next function is called sleep4, and what this does is it allows the current thread to block for the speci specified uh, duration of time. And sleep until, which allows the thread to block until a particular point in time is reached. So the difference between sleep for and sleep until sleep for, you specify a duration to sleep for, like sleep for five seconds, for example, or sleep until you give it a particular point in time to sleep until, like sleep until January 5th at 9 p.m. or something like that. On this slide, we have a simple example of using the get ID function in the this thread namespace. And essentially what we have, if we start out by looking at the main function, what the main function does is it, it calls the get ID function in the this thread namespace to figure out what is the ID of the, the main thread, in other words, the thread that's executing the main function. And then this ID is written into a global variable called main thread, which is this global variable up above here, which has the type thread ID. Then what we do is we proceed in the main function to create a new thread object T, which is going to execute the following code, the code which just calls the function func. And then also in the main function itself, we're going to call the function func. And the idea here is we want func to do different things depending on whether it's being called by the main thread, in other words, the thread that's executing the main function, or the new thread that we've just created that's associated with this object T. And the way that we accomplish this, if we look at the, the function func up above here, what we do is inside this function, we call the get ID function in the this thread namespace to figure out what is the thread ID that's currently execute, or what is the ID of the thread that's currently executing, in other words, executing this function func. 
And if that ID that's returned is equal to the main thread, this means that the thread that's called func must be the main thread because the thread that's currently executing is the main thread. And in this case, we just print out, hey, we were called by the main thread. Otherwise, we print out we were called by another thread, the secondary thread. So this gives us a way to change the behavior of a function depending on which thread is actually invoking it. And sometimes you may want to do this to have the behavior of the code change depending on which thread is actually executing it. And then to finish off the main function, of course, we perform a join operation to make, th make sure that the, the uh, thread that we've created, which is associated with the object T, is actually finished, its execution, and we mark the thread object as unjoinable before we we exit the main function and destroy the thread object T. One thing to be careful of when using threads is if you have a thread function that takes parameters and some of those parameters might be references or pointers, it's really important to make sure that those references and pointers or maybe iterators as well will continue to be valid for the entire duration that the thread is running. So in other words, be careful about the lifetime of, of different objects that are involved. And this example on this slide is illustrating uh, where some problems can arise if you're not careful with respect to lifetimes of variables. So in this particular example, we have this function called threadfunk, which takes a pointer to a vector of integers, basically a pointer to const. So it's a constant object, and it basically just loops over all the elements in the vector, computing the, the sum of the elements, and then prints them out to standard output. Then we have a function called start thread. What it does is it creates a vector with a large number of elements, and it all initialized to one. Then we start up, a, we create a thread object, T, which is going to execute the thread function, which is called thread func that we were just looking at above and it's passing it the address of v, so it passes it the address of this vector that we've just created, and then it calls detach on this thread object, which will cause the thread of execution to continue to execute independently of this thread object. And then we proceed to return. When we return, the thread object is destroyed, t is destroyed, but because we detached the thread, the thread will continue to ha quite happily to run after this function returns. Then if we look at what the main function does here, we call start thread, and then we go to sleep for some period of time, and then the program terminates. Now this particular program has a very serious problem, and the serious problem here, if you haven't already noticed it, is that we, we pass a pointer to this vector v into the thread function, which is then running in a separate thread, and then this function returns, which will have the effect of destroying v, because v is a local variable in this function start thread. So when this function returns, v goes away, it's destroyed. However, after this function returns, this, the thread that's executing this thread func may still be running. In fact, probably it is still running because the vector is fairly large which means that this pointer here is no longer to pointing to anything valid because the thing that it's pointing to has been destroyed. So this is one thing to be a little bit careful about when you're using, th when you're using threads. If you're passing parameters into a thread function and you're using pointers or references and so on, be very careful to make sure that those pointers and references or iterators that you're using, they continue to refer to valid data for the entire duration that that thread is running. Otherwise, you'll run into problems, obviously. In multi-threaded programs, sometimes the need arises for per-thread data. So we want to have a variable name refer to a distinct object in each thread. And when we use a particular variable name, the particular object it refers to will depend on which thread is currently executing. Essentially, each thread has its own object that's associated with a particular variable name. And the lifetime of the object is the duration of the thread in which the object was created. This is what we call thread local storage. Now if you want to obtain an object with thread local storage, you need to use the thread local specifier in the variable declaration for that variable. So for example here, we have a global variable called counter which is of type int and we've included the thread local specifier for it. So what this means is that 
each thread in the program will have its own instance or own version of this counter variable and they're all independent from one another. Uh, furthermore, as you can see in this example, you can initialize thread local variables. So what this means is each time a new thread starts, and each time a new thread is created, when it starts executing, the global variable counter will be initialized to zero. So you can still have initializers with, um, with thread local variables. You can also have thread local variables that are local variables to a function, basically variables of block scope, for example, like what we have here. Here we have a counter uh, variable, which is of type int. It's been declared as thread local. So this means that each thread that's using this function func will have its own instance or own version of this counter variable. And when you have a thread local, which is um, local, like a local variable in a function, this also implies the static keyword as well. So this line of code here in the comment is exactly equivalent to what we have above. On this slide, we have an example of using thread local storage. So on line five, you can see that we have a global variable called counter, which has type int that's been declared as thread local. And it's also initialized to zero. So what this means, because the variable is thread local, it means that each thread will have its own instance or version of this variable. Also, you can see the variables initialized to zero. So that means each thread, when it's a new thread is started or a new thread is created, when it first starts executing, the value of counter will be initialized to zero for that thread. Then we have this function do work. And essentially what happens in this program, do work is going to be called from four different threads, the, the main thread, and then we'll also start three other threads as well. And id is just a unique value from zero to three inclusive, which is passed into this function, indicating which of the four threads is actually calling this function. And then what we do in this function is we just loop 10 times for i going from zero to nine inclusive. And we're printing out the value uh, of the counter, this counter variable each time through the loop and also incrementing it. Then if we go down and look at the main function, the main function, it, we have a vector of threads called workers, and we loop three times, creating a new, thread, a new thread each time, where the thread is going to execute the function do work, and it's going to pass in the parameter i, which is basically a number between one and three. So this is the looping variable up above, so it takes on values one to three. And also we're going to invoke the do work func function from the main thread, in other words, from the, the thread that's executing the main function. And in this case, we're going to pass zero. So there's basically four distinct values, zero through three inclusive, that get passed in as a parameter to do work. Then if we look at the function do work up above, uh, you can see that we're taking an ID as a parameter, an integer parameter, which is basically a number zero to three, indicating which of the threads is actually calling this function. And then all this code is doing is it printing out a single letter, which is either A, B, C, or D, depending on which of the four threads is calling this function. And then it's incrementing the counter 10 times through the loop and printing the value of the counter. Here we're printing the counter and here we're incrementing it. And the important thing to understand in this example, and really the whole point of this example, is that each thread that's calling do work has its own version of this variable counter or own instance of it. So when one thread is incrementing the value of counter, this has no effect on the value of counter for other threads because they actually all have separate instances of this variable. In other words, the name counter refers to different variables in the different threads.